you guys have been listening to a bunch of really uh, compelling speakers and, and charismatic presenters with, with great uh, demonstrations and great insights and, and great kind of philosophical perspectives. And I'm here to put an end to that. Uh, you guys all look tired, and at least the good news is, you know, there's going to be cocktails soon, so, so I'll try and make this as short and painless as possible. I will have a couple of minutes at the end for, for questions, um, but I really wanted to talk to you guys uh, generally about AI. Uh, as the title says, in fiction and fact, um, and I've had a, a really weird perspective uh, on this in, in my career. I'm the creative director uh, of the Halo franchise over at Microsoft. Uh, and we have a famous AI, um, her name is Cortana. Um, she started uh, life in 2001, uh, was completely fictional character. She is a personal assistant of sorts. She's an intelligence agent, uh, and she eventually becomes your friend if you play through the game. Uh, back then, that was complete sci-fi. Um, as we uh, thought about what Cortana could do, we were being futurists. We were saying, wouldn't it be great if she could respond to you in this way, or if she could hack this computer system or open this door? Um, and so to have watched her um, evolve uh, from a completely fictional character into a fully functional AI device uh, has been weird and amazing for me. And uh, a couple of years ago, we heard that Microsoft was getting close to putting the finishing touches on its AI companion, its AI personal assistant. Um, people who are more familiar with Siri and Alexa kind of know what that means. She helps you with your scheduling, she helps with your appointments, and so on and so on. Um, they were working on something that they wanted to have, have a real personality, so they codenamed it Cortana, which is genius if you think about it, because no one's ever gonna guess that Cortana's an AI companion, and anyway. <laughs> I, I wasn't involved in that, but they came and talked to us about, about AIs, about the, kind of the, the fictional um, wrapping of, of AI personality, because personality was the thing that they wanted to make distinctive about Cortana. They wanted her to be super helpful and logical and rational, but they also wanted her to be relatable, um, and we had kind of a prototype of that. So I got to work with them on how Cortana behaves, how she tells jokes, how she sings songs, uh, how she engages with you. Um, when you think about what the, the definition of an AI is, I think it goes all the way, all the way back to, to, to Greece, ancient Greece, literally, where, where the, the concept of deus ex machina comes from. Um, but a, a, a futurist uh, and scientist of sorts, uh, Pamela McCorduck, uh, said that it was an ancient desire to forge the gods um, was the impetus for creating AI. I don't really believe that, I think, but I love that idea that we were trying to build gods, and I'll come back to that at the end of this talk. Um, I think uh, AI were built to help us do stuff. The same reason we invented swords and shovels and plowshares and all that stuff. And as our machines get more sophisticated, they need to be smarter uh, and they need to be ultimately more relatable. So when I think of AI, to me, the big division between an AI and any other kind of computing system is persona and relatability uh, and the ability to learn. Um, but I think a digital watch is arguably an AI of sorts. It's thinking about time all the time. It augments its user. Now the user knows what time it is. It's a dumb version of an AI. Um, but I think that you can get tangled up in what that definition is. Um, I think that, you know, having dealt with the definition, the, the next question people ask is, will AI rise up and kill us? <laughs> Obviously, yes, they will. So let's we'll just get that out of the way. I did, I did a non-scientific uh, sort of research on AI and sci-fi. 85%, you can go do this on Amazon, 85% rise up and kill you in, when you deal with AI. Very few good outcomes. Um, but right now, uh, the AI that are in my house, whether it be Cortana, whether it be Amazon's Echo, or even Siri, um, they're, they're helping me do stuff. They're helping me navigate to a destination. They're helping me keep track of my calendar and so on. Um, and that's what Cortana was designed to do in the game. And that's what she was designed to do in the story, is be your friend, but also help you do stuff. That's one use. Um, I want to talk to you today about other uses of personality uh, and AI. And I think that, um, if I can make this, yeah. Teaching. So right now, America is going through an educational crisis. And it's really an economic crisis as well. People are being basically forced to get degrees just to be in the middle class. It's like a certificate of entry into the middle class. Meanwhile, the middle class is shrinking. The price of an education is going up. Uh, and the quality of an education is arguably 
all over the place. If you go to Yale, it's great. If you're, if you're in a pay for degree mill college, it's terrible and it's a waste of money. Um, and while we have some of the best educational institutions in the world, we also have a really serious problem um, that we're gonna have to solve. And I think AIs are gonna be part of that. And I think it's gonna happen sooner than you think. Um, an AI could be literally the best college professor that Harvard ever produced. Um, it could absorb that, that college professor's persona. Um, it could as, absorb his teaching style. Um, but importantly, it's a one-on-one -on -one, um, experience. Through your phone, via the cloud, and I'm saying phone, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. When you work in sci-fi, actually add 100 years to any idea that you have, because otherwise it comes back to bite you. <laughs> if you watch any 70s or 80s sci-fi, look at the TV monitors, you just add 100 years. And light speed, 500 years. Um, but I think that right now, you can have an AI on your phone. The computing is done in the cloud, so the device agnosticism is gonna be important eventually. It's just gonna be built into your clothes, into the room. That's all, we're already there with things like Echo. Um, your room is listening to you and it has access to the cloud and it can be an AI. But a teacher um, could teach a kid uh, Harvard level education in French to a kid in a village in Ghana if he has a phone. Um, that's going to be the, the future, I think, of education. And I think it's also going to help us solve the cost of education. Having a individual one-on-one -on -one teaching experiences anywhere in the world in any language is going to reduce the cost and the risk of an education. And further, if a kid is going to take eight years to get his BA in English, some of you might have kids that are actually going through that. Um, it kind of doesn't matter because you're not wasting money, you're not wasting cycles, and the teacher can adapt to that kid's specific needs. And it doesn't have to be a degree. It could be trade skill. It could be any kind of teaching. And I think that's important. And I think the scary thing is, um, for a lot of professions, is that this kind of thinking could be applied to any job that is the transmission of information um, and knowledge. And a doctor is that. If you go to your GP, they're not gonna perform a surgery on you. They're not gonna do anything mechanical or physical for the most part. You're gonna ask questions, they're gonna ask questions. Um, WebMD does a dumb version of this right now. You can get good information from that. But a, an AI doctor could do something much more specific, much more custom tailored to your problems, and then recommend that you go see a specialist, because that's kind of what your GP does right now. Um, <laughs> Dentist, that's a, that's a mechanical thing. Machines will be doing that eventually, but I think that's a little bit further off. And that's we're at this weird tipping point with AI where it's doing a lot of the stuff that we're talking about today at a simple level and sometimes at a fairly complex level. This, I think, is gonna be one of the fastest moving and fastest evolving uses of technology that we've ever had. Um, to Jim's point, the first one, arguably, was 50 years ago. Um, 13 years ago when I was working on Halo, it was, you know, Deep Blue had just beaten Kasparov, um, but it was stated then that, that while chess has a finite number of permutations, Go does not. They're basically infinite. So no one will ever beat a Go champion. And here we are, you know, a few weeks later. Um, and it was using instinct and it was using intuition. It wasn't just crunching numbers. And it was also behaving in an alien way. It was going for little incremental points that a real Go player would never bother with because they're a waste of effort. Com computers don't care that they're wasting effort. They'll do what it needs to win. And I think that that's gonna change. That's gonna be one of the hardest things for us to solve because I think we can teach a computer to think like a human, but we don't know how to teach it to think like much else. Um, and I'll touch on that in a little bit. Teenagers, um, arguably nature's greatest mistake. They are. <laughs> Almost, almost as strong as an adult. Um, no impulse control whatsoever. Um, no income and no practical purpose. They're a giant money pit. Um, sorry if any of you have teenagers, but you, you might understand what I'm talking about. This is actually happening now. I believe it's Chevy, but a couple of other auto manufacturers already have anti-teenager technology. It's not quite AI, but it is thinking. You can't turn the radio on until you plug in your seatbelt. That's a dumb version of that. But imagine if an AI was with your kid all the time, 30 years from now. It's built into his clothes in the way that it's built into your phone right now. And in instead of just being kind of a spy for a parent, it's actually a real moral compass. It's actually explaining why things are bad, explaining why make a point is dangerous, explaining why dead man's curve is a super obviously dangerous place to not drive around really fast. 
cars are maybe a bad example because there's a good possibility that my seven-year-old is never going to drive a car. Her Tesla might be taking her to the prom. She's not gone to the prom, but um, <laughs> but moral guidance moral guidance is something that a thinking AI could do as a peer um, in a way that isn't bullying or parental. Um, you guys are mostly marketers. Um, one of your biggest challenges is getting past people's filters. They now have the ability to block pop-ups. They have the ability to delete cookies. Um, they can avoid things. They can watch things on Netflix without seeing advertising. and they can skip on TiVo. Um, AIs are going to actually make that more of a challenge for you guys because AI can filter things perfectly. It can expose you only to what you're interested in. So I would argue that the, the challenge for marketers is to build AIs that can defeat that. Um, I would never, ever, ever have used Uber had I not had it explained to me by a person. People are the best um, negotiators, and they're the best at convincing people of things. Having a friend tell you that Uber is a really smooth, easy service, and you don't have to talk to the cab driver, no amount of advertising can really reinforce that as well as a person can. So I think that AIs as a marketing tool and advertising tool are going to be people, and they're going to compel people to do things. They're going to convince people, and they're going to cajole them in a way that blunt force advertising absolutely can't. So while it is going to be a, a, a challenge and a hurdle, it's also going to be a huge opportunity. And you're going to be able to persuade people with AIs. Um, personalities. Just suck in the wisdom of what Kanye is saying there for a second. Um, I'm using a, a famous uh, Twitter celebrity on purpose. Um, you could absorb the persona of anyone. You could absorb the persona of a volunteer. You could absorb the persona of a celebrity. And again, this is 20, 30 years from now. You could sell a personality. If you are a person that people aspire to be or like or want to be, you can sell that personality. You're, it's going to take a lot of brute force programming to get all that stuff into a, a sort of portable fashion. But the, the beauty of this is everyone could be Kanye's friend and then go to school the next day and all be able to relate. And that means weird things like lonely people could have more friends and make better relationships with real people because of the practice that they're getting with, with AI personalities. There are all sorts of um, really compelling things that you can do with a persona. Um, and I think that also synthetic personalities are going to be huge. And not just as friends or as peers, but as celebrities. If there, there's, a, there's a movie a few, from a few years ago called, uh, I think, Simone. And, um, it's a synthetic personality that becomes a celebrity. That's going to be a real thing because it's going to be funnier and wittier and quicker than a lot of uh, other uh, TV personalities um, to make that comparison. No one's ever going to be as great as, uh, as Ye, though. Um, <laughs> bodies. I think we think about um, AIs as disembodied souls. They're, they're, they're these things in a machine, and they're, they're personalities like Hal where they don't need even a, a face. Um, I think they are going to need bodies. I think your dentist AI is going to need a body to actually do physical things to your teeth. Um, but there's recently some research in Japan that showed that old people, and they're having a, a crisis with the elderly, eventually old people are going to need to be taken care of because there aren't going to be enough uh, kids to take care of them. Um, and the, uh, in, in Japan, they found that the elderly react better to, to non-anthropomorphic AIs. In this case, it's a harbor seal, but that's not going to help clean you and put you to bed and change your diaper when you get old. And so I think that whatever those bodies are, they're going to have to be suitable for the purpose that the AI is intended to take care of. Um, and I think you're going to see a lot of, you know, uh, if you think about um, Big Hero uh, 8, Big Hero 6, yeah. Um, that is actually a good example of what it's going to be because you're not going to feel embarrassed if that thing is taking care of you. Um, so we're going to have a lot of sort of aesthetic uh, design challenges ahead of us as well as uh, programmatical challenges. This one's uh, a buzzkill because I know that everyone loves a buzzkill at the end of the day. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, both my parents died within a month of each other um, independently. They lived in different countries. They hadn't spoken to each other in 40 years. And I had to go to Scotland and England um, back to back to, to go to funerals. I didn't know my parents very well. And I'm, you know, I'm in my 40s now, and I'm a lot more philosophical about it and a lot more uh, capable of understanding that maybe I was part of the problem with that communication stream. And I, I started to miss them, and there was nothing I could do about it. I couldn't talk to my mom or dad or ask them questions or find out more about their lives. A hundred years from now, your 
you and your children and your children's children are going to be absorbed into data. Um, Facebook is doing it right now. Facebook knows a lot about you. Imagine a future Facebook that knows what you look like, what you sound like, what your mannerisms are, what the cadence of your speech is, all of that stuff. Um, that's going to happen. The, the question is, what do you do with that? What do you do with a personality? Um, uh, I think ghosts are going to be a real thing. I think people are going to want to be close to their loved ones, their departed loved ones. Um, there's comfort in that. Uh, there's a lot of moral and philosophical questions about that and what it really means. Is that really your, your mom or your dad or your, your child? No, it's not. But does it provide you comfort and can it give you closure? Maybe it can. And you can apply, this is a morbid one, but you can apply that to a lot of happier scenarios as well um, and, and make people live again. And it can be historical characters. Imagine, you know, going back to the teacher example, imagine learning about triangles from Pythagoras. It'd be a synthesis of him, what we think he was like, but you're gonna be able to make historical characters live again, and you're gonna be able to relate to those characters. And they might be pretty good synthesis of the, the original. We won't know for sure. But in the future, everyone, there's gonna be data about everyone's persona, uh, and it's all going to be collected, and it's gonna be up to us. Uh, to, to do with it what we will. And pet owners are already going through this now a little bit with cloning of pets. Is that really Fido? Does it, does it matter? Are you getting joy out of that? And is it useful to you? So I think that's gonna happen. Uh, and again, it's a buzzkill, but I think there might be a lot of joy and comfort and things like that um, for a lot of different people. And again, the, the brute force computing power is going to happen. It's already happening now. Your phone isn't very powerful, but the cloud is. And so terminals to this kind, of, uh, this kind of power are going to be there. And speaking of power, brute force computing, energy, economies, all of those kind of singularities that we're going to have to solve in the next decades um, are what this is all reliant on. If we can't get it together technologically, these are, these are still going to be sci-fi dreams, but most of them are happening right now in some shape or form. So um, at the start, I, I, you know, I, there, there's a futurist named Pamela McCorduck who said you know, that uh, the AIs were born from an ancient desire to create our gods, basically. This is the dream of the 15% of AI sci-fi that doesn't end in the world being destroyed and <laughs> enslaved by, by the way, have you noticed that they give a lot of robots claws? Like, I'm just saying that's not a great idea. So, and, and I'm an optimist. I just like a really strong robot with claws. It just doesn't sound like a, a, a really great idea. Um, eventually AIs, it, all things being equal, we solve an energy crisis, we solve the computing crisis that we're gonna run into with this stuff, storage for example, if you're gonna have every person on Earth, and let's just say we, we solve population and it's two or three billion people, that's a lot of information about a lot of people um, to have in any kind of detail. So there's a lot of like weird technology things that people don't necessarily think about that we're still gonna have to solve. But I would argue that the, the idea of, and Ian Banks' culture novels deal with this in a really good way. They have two societies. There's the human society, and humans run around in a leisure society, or sometimes do dirty work on the ground, and the AIs are godlike. They, they live much faster than us. They live in a, a sort of a sublimated space, uh, literally and allegorically above our heads. Um, and they're effectively gods. They have godlike powers. They're, they have godlike intelligence. They're omniscient. They're omnipresent. Um, and they're effectively omnipotent. Um, we can do that. The, the, the path to that technology is coming where, where computers cooperating with each other, AIs cooperating with each other can solve economic issues. They can run the entire global economy uh, and run it perfectly. Um, they can solve even diplomatic issues and so forth. But humans are gonna be the biggest obstacle to that. If we had this technology right now and we asked even two countries, even two friendly countries, like let's just say Belgium and France, if we ask them to link up their economies via AI, they would just say no. So we're gonna be the biggest confounding limiting factor to this because we don't wanna give up control. Uh, we don't trust the AIs because we know they're gonna destroy us and enslave us, that's fair. Um, <laughs> but we're gonna have to change in order to get most of the benefits from a future uh, that is run by AIs. And it will be, that's inevitable. But we're gonna have to change, and that's gonna be the slowest part of this. Um, and as Arthur C. Clarke said, um, any technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. And I think this will be magical, but like I said at the start, 
I'm going to add 100 years to my 100-year outlook for this and uh, keep my fingers crossed that it all happens. Um, and I think I maybe have a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah. Let's do, yeah. yeah. Questions out here. Anybody? Questions? Oh, way over there. In the, one over there, and then we'll come over here. So my question to you is, when is the point that Siri and Alexa is going to have contextual persistence between, take me to Bill's house, call him on the phone? Sorry, I don't hear, understand what you mean by call him on the phone. That, I, that's a great question, because that's a short-term version of the issue that I just mentioned about you know, France and Belgium's economy. Though there's, there's uh, economic and sort of uh, business principles at play there. I, I personally make a kind of hodgepodge of AIs in my house. Like Alexa does some things, and she talks to my, my uh, iPhone, my uh, Cortana is used through my band, and so on. So I kind of have it all band-aided together, and the gaps are really confounding and irritating. And I think that consumer demand to fix those gaps is going to be what drives those, those uh, seamless communications. But companies are going to have to agree, and systems are going to have to happen. We have plenty of systems with PCs. You know, web browsers and the internet are good examples of that. Like those are a shared system, and so we just have to get to that. And I, I think making it seamless is going to be huge, and uh, and all, always being listened to currently uh, is going to be super important. And that takes power, and you have to charge the thing that's listening, and so on and so on. Cool. Question over here. Go ahead. Hey, Frank. Aaron. Nice. Aaron Lemay. Uh, one question I had about this is I, I think a lot about AI and about where the future is going. Where do you think about uh, language and how we will communicate in the future with AI as far as like how it affect society and whatnot? I think that, that that's something we're on the cusp of right now. This year, you can, you can have your speech translated in real time. Um, again, I'll add 20 years to it. 20 years from now, um, that Star Trek thing that translates fluently in real time with cultural nuance is going to be there. And I think people get really paranoid about language and trying to preserve it uh, because it's cultural, right? And they don't want their culture to change. Um, and France, for example, protects its language legally even. Well, you can protect your language and speak fluent English at the same time. And, uh, and I think that the language and culture barrier is the number one reason for geopolitical conflict anyway. Uh, and AIs uh, and real-time translation um, especially if it's intelligent and especially if it's nuanced and careful and respectful, um, will we'll further lower those barriers. And I think that's a, that's a thing we're going to see benefits from now. And we already are. You can, you can send a polite mail using Google Translate uh, to, to someone in Japan right now and not really know what you're saying, but know that it's probably polite. So. 